what we're gonna see on the videos. Well, it's full HD and it's supposed to be full HD yeah. as well. Yeah. Some slides. So. Yeah, that's no problem. You can you can stand up and wave people. <laughs> I actually believe in, in the merit process and this, so people have to know who who did the thing. Who they can punch? Yes, and that's as well. Oh, that's it. Not all people like to learn on slides. You know? Actually, okay, let me just, uh, just a second. I'll do a bit of. Just a second. I did a stupid mistake that I want to rectify. Just and now we'll return back to screen. Okay. Some configuration. No. <laughs> I'll tell people at the end. Uh, yes. Thank you. So just in the last uh, minute and a half, I actually noticed that uh, the date here was the last weekend when I was given this talk, a variation of this talk at Fosden. So it's kind of a DEF CON at Fosden, right? So now it's the uh, right date, at least for today. <laughs> and we can start with it. So. Um, the, is the idea for this talk actually started more than half a year ago when um, we gradually worked it on the uh, um, server side to get all the bits and pieces for the uh, single sign-on uh, available. And then uh, I started looking how those pieces can be combined together to have our laptops and overall our desktops um, working nicely so that there's no excuse anymore called Mac OS X to be on the uh, desktop with Linux. It shouldn't be cool, it should just work. And I came first to GNOME Foundation at the Guadec with this uh, idea and a practical demos of what can be achieved with as little as possible, which show it what uh, roadblocks we have. Now, six months later, we have those, some of those roadblocks eliminated, and it actually shows how far you can get with even a little of uh, effort there. 
And some of that effort is really small one, but some, some of the work was <coughs> groundbreaking. But let's go there. So we talk about enterprise desktop and the GoaDeck was last year quite interesting in this sense. We had two talks on enterprise desktop, one coming from Red Hat, one coming from Suzy. The Suzy talk was traditional uh, enterprise desktop, mainly a Linux desktop to run your office applications. And uh, traditionally people think that the desktop for enterprise is actually that. You get office applications to run, some documents to write, some presentations to show, mm -hmm. and so on. And you are basically limited to that. Okay, there are printers that can be used to print. If they don't work, that's our fail, meaning the server guys and not the desktop people. And when desktop is uh, enterprise Linux desktop is usually mentioned. It's in the migrations from Windows where people try to compare how easily to use it, basically what the icons there, what is the UX experience natural for them and so on, but not all the um, integration into the environment that, that this desktop runs with. So yeah, enterprise, but almost, yeah. I work from home and in a sense my local office network which I do have, we have office in Finland for Red Hat, but it's the same as I, if I work it from home because there's no IT support uh, that, that supports that office. We do support, we associates support it ourselves. So working from home with VPN is equal working from the office that we have, except that I don't see my colleagues and I can be of certain uh, freedom of what I wear or where I see it, <laughs> or lie. And, um, but at the same time, the company services that are in use or in enforced to be used by employees, they also not in this certain central place. And that place is actually might be spread out over different clouds, not even the single one. And we can even have something that's inside, outside, an internal cloud or a single machine somewhere or provided by external providers. There are plenty of them and I'm sure everybody can really uh, experience about that. And also, uh, even if I use the corporate laptop and I have certain limitations of what I can do on it, uh, Red Hat is very good at allowing to do open source work on, on the corporate laptops. And so I need to have corporate identity to sign in into corporate applications, whatever they are. They might be just, I don't know, uh, uh, places where somebody else brag about bacon and pizza. Uh, but still, it's a corporate stuff. I have my home network which I also need to use even from the uh, uh, corporate laptop if I want to print which is my printer is there or it at the local office the printer is actually uh, managed by the uh, company that manages the local space. <coughs> at the same time there are plenty of social networking and uh, if you look at the uh, messages that the uh, DEF CONF organizers are putting out they are explicitly asking you to be active on social networks, promoting uh, your talks and talks of your colleagues and written blogs and so on. And I only have this laptop with me. So I have to have access to those social services if I want to participate and win something that they promise it for the best blog about. <laughs> then um, I participate in multiple free software projects. So, so to say I have multiple hats to wear if they all fit here, but sometimes I need to kind of ju uh, juggle them. <coughs> but also at the same time I have um, governmental <coughs> IDs issued to me and sometimes I have to use those governmental IDs when talking to tax office. Luckily in Finland people don't like to talk uh, face to face with the government. So the government made a perfect system where you just log in over the web using your smart cards and uh, bank credentials. Uh, that avoids talking 
but it means that you have those identities to be supported on Linux uh, to be useful. <coughs> and I also have my private data, whether it's a private data on a corporate laptop, which supposedly not to be there, it's still there, um, and I want to protect and share it with those whom I care about, and I kind of crazy person that wants to have access to that all at the same time. Is this a rare example? I think most of you can relate to the same story. So I work on free IPA, which is really <laughs> um, a management of identities and policies. Uh, store it in a single place and force it at the, uh, um, at the end. Uh, endpoints, which those laptops are one of the example, applied locally, and um, it's a number of different free software projects uni unified together in, in, um, in a common management framework to rule them all. So it's available in multiple distributions, slowly but surely it, uh, most of its capabilities uh, infiltrate stable versions. So like two years ago, we missed by one week a deadline, a freeze deadline in Debian. So Debian has free IPA server side, but only in testing, because we just missed a deadline. Uh, hopefully <laughs> next deadline will already be, uh, we will be uh, ready to that. And um, GNOME Foundation and GNOME as an organization runs Free APA as their accounting system. So all GNOME developers, they have account in account GNOME org, which is Free APA. If you go there right now, you will see that it's standard Free APA login screen, which you will see um, today. So <coughs> how enterprising are we? There are multiple ways of uh, scoring. So let's score by one obvious thing, by password. If you have multiple passwords to enter, you're not enterprise. Uh, and the lower number of passwords you enter, because in an enterprise marketing material, so if you sell enterprise products, the single sign-on phrase is kind of rules them all. None of those products actually has real single sign-on, but they attempt to do it. So a typical workflow, if you're happy enough to reboot your laptop, is actually um, you have to sign in in your local system account. So and you enter a password. You jump onto a virtual private network, VPN to your office environment. That might include a password and maybe a token value one way or another, a certificate, and God knows what. Um, if your corporate environment uses Kerberos or Active Directory, uh, you most likely will obtain the Kerberos ticket and then supply this ticket to uh, application. Or you're supposed to use Kerberos ticket as evidence that you are who you are to those applications and therefore go with single sign-on in those apps. But you already strike, stroke like three times that password before you go to that point. Um, and many of those enterprise apps actually do not support Kerberos. So in fact, you will have to be a, a requested to enter a password again. <coughs> so can we be really better than this? Uh, obviously, crossing out some password entering procedures that you have to do, well, let's say every day, uh, would probably be good. Can we really slim it down to one or two? Let's see. Let's try to log in. Um, I'm not gonna run a live demo, so I have pre-recorded videos which show the same stuff. This one was done in, in VM. And basically, I'm just trying to log on 
to that VM. The VM is enrolled into a free IP server that I have. And the VM is actually not on the same network as I have. Therefore, I use a VPN to log on there. And as you saw, there's no, there's nothing um, to enter. There's no password required because I used Kerberos credentials that I obtained when I tried to log on. And those Kerberos credentials were forwarded over the uh, Kerberos proxy in through the public internet to obtain a ticket, so here is the, uh, um, in the second output of KList, you see the first ticket is HTTP slash, that's, that's the ticket to my um, VPN service. That this ticket was obtained without any credentials entering because they already have credentials. And now as that I'm on the uh, VPN to my internal network, I can actually run IPA commands to that uh, uh, IPA server which is behind the VPN. So it's not accessible from the public internet but it's accessible obviously on the internet, uh, on the intranet. <coughs> so this is, this is the basic thing. We just logged on on a system that is configured to be a client of free IPA, SSSD as a local daemon that enforces IPA policies and provides all these users and IDs. Um, it handles logon and Kerberos keys. The logon verified over a public network using proxy for Kerberos protocol. The uh, VPN connection based, uh, authenticates based on the Kerberos ticket that I obtained it on top of uh, ticket grants and ticket or initial ticket that I got when I log on. My credentials were entered only once in that logon screen. It's kind of a paradise, right? What I'm dreaming at night. <laughs> so this Kerberos proxy, it's actually, uh, in, at some time, good things come out of Microsoft. <laughs> Not only in form of Hyper-V and uh, Azure and, and so on, but also some real good things like this Kerberos proxy. They had this exactly same problem with the Windows lab, uh, Windows workstations for the customers. And they invented this protocol of uh, proxying Kerberos data over HTTPS to allow to get initial ticket then use that ticket to establish um, the uh, VPN connection uh, and use uh, IPv6 over that VPN connection to bring together all the laptops. It happens behind the uh, behind the curtain. You don't see it. If you're Active Directory uh, administrator configured all this thing, you just don't see anything. It just works. But it took them a certain amount of time. I think they introduced this first in 2007 or so. And it didn't really work well until 2010 or so because the client side needed to be updated. They needed to build uh, IPv6 infrastructure to host all these uh, virtual VPN environments and so on. So um, Nathaniel McCallum in, uh, implemented this protocol for uh, MIT Kerberos and as a separate Kerberos proxy server and then we integrated one with I think Christian did this work to in integrate it in free IPA 4.2 so now if you deploy free IPA 4.2 you get the Kerberos proxy enabled by default it's on the same HTTPS uh, port like the uh, management interface that uh, IPA runs which is neat you just do it um, and your public network can be used to connect and, and get there. Um, GNOME guys are really spearheading the uh, deployment. Two years ago, once we introduced the Kerberos proxy uh, in free IPA um, for zero, I think even before that, they 
simply deployed it for their own needs uh, to allow the developers to use GSS API for SSH connections. And that is to replace the SSH keys access to make sure that you have single sign-on but you still have pretty serious security over that, that one ticket is expiring over some time. SSH keys, people have habit to keep them decades instead of rotating them regularly. And on the uh, VPN side, last DevConf, we talked with Nikos from the um <coughs> Open Connect, and we persuaded him that it's actually an interesting problem, and he solved it in less than one week. So Open Connect client supports GSS API negotiation since Fedora 22, and the uh, Open Connect server supports it. Uh, own Kerberos proxy. So uh, you can use actually Open Connect server as your proxy. That's what I do. And uh, my VPN runs open, uh, runs Kerberos proxy <coughs> at the same time as, as the VPN itself. Open VPN does not support GSS API and uh, its developers have interesting mixture of understanding <coughs> why GSS API is interesting and they think that it's kind of not the technology that you should use. You should use X509 certificates. Uh, let we'll leave this them. That's not quite true. <laughs> well, I mean, th there are some stories you can really look up using the search engines, the responses that I referred to, um, and they did not change in in last five or seven years. It's been on uh, something I, on my side project I have had since I started playing with it in 2015, and uh, that's actually the first time we actually thought about GSS API. So in 2005, people were asking on uh, OpenVPN development list for support for GSS API, and it was negatively responding all the time. Uh, IPsec has this um, standardized for IT1, if I understood, Paul. It's an older version, but yeah. Um, no, uh, so so my, apparently Microsoft has done a few proxies out for IT2, so that's the one we've been focusing on. Yeah, so it's in the works now, and uh, Libris one will, would get it. Uh, hopefully this year. <laughs> so there's, there's improvement uh, compared to what we had even six months ago. Um, could we do stronger authentication at the, uh, at the VPN edge? Because you don't want to just allow everyone to connect into the enterprise with, uh, with ticket that was obtained with a single, single uh, factor. So yeah, with Kerberos 1.14, which is out, we have support for so-called uh, authenticator indicators there. Already, like Nathaniel found uh, this week, uh, they already put the OTP indicator if you indi uh, use it to two-factor authentication to log in. Uh, but we don't have enforcement yet. This is coming very soon. It's high on my priorities. Yes. So. Two-factor authentication is what we support in free APA uh, for HOTP, TOTP uh, types of uh, tokens. So things like YubiKey with HOTP, TOTP token uh, written in it. Or you can use free OTP client on Android or iOS or you have some Blackberry stuff even. Oh, it's outdated? No, BlackBerry is switching to Android, so... So, yeah, that's the, that's the cheating <laughs> stuff, yep. <laughs> and the, um, the two-factor auth is enforced for users on the Kerberos side. So once you try to log in, if you have the uh, two-factor enforce it and one factor is disabled, then you will not be able to get Kerberos ticket unless you really use... There are some problems on how to make it sure without the clients that know how to deal with it. So SSSD knows how to deal with it. Uh, a regular key in it doesn't. You need to be, um, you need to do some tricks. So how this works? 
this is free OTP. You can install it and use, and I guess many of you are using if you're in Red Hat. So let's try to see it. Here is the same session that I had, right? So this poor user has been a member of group USB access. This is just to allow UDEV to map uh, permissions to allow the programming the USB token. And I'm doing this programming actually in the console just because we don't have, from the browser, we don't have access to USB devices. <laughs> and that's probably for a good thing. And uh, it also means that having some nice desktop UI integrated with IPA that knows about the features like these tokens and is able to program the token uh, without referring to the actual commands would be very nice to have. Nathaniel actually implemented the YubiKey support in just one, <coughs> one night. It's like 25 lines of code. Yeah. So write your own and we'll merge it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now I have the token. And suppose I inserted the actual token into the machine. Let's pretend that this is really show. Uh, I closed the screen. And now what you see is that instead of a password prompt, I get a first factor prompt. I did not change anything. I just locked the machine. And when GDM asks me for the prompt, what, what, what to enter, SSSD sees that the uh, Kerberos server actually is responding with the uh, I need additional information uh, kind of response. And that means that it, it also returns a prompt that I can show. We are uh, a bit weirder, so we told them, uh, called them first factor, second factor. Uh, of course, the people who want to uh, have them name it uh, properly can file bugs and talk to to the people who so sorry one is your password and the other is your yubikey one is the password is another is token generated by yubikey exactly same can happen if i load the um, uh, free otp and have a token generated let me launch free otp Yeah. Keyboard interface, and uh, you can change the uh, hash space. So if if I press on this one, then it generates a code, and I enter the same code. YubiKey is just a keyboard uh, in and reality. Actually, we're going to be adding. iOS already has it, but we can't get uh, Apple to release it. Uh, to send the code from the phone to the computer, yeah. typed in over Bluetooth. So using Bluetooth as a keyboard, your phone can be keyboard and free OTP then inserts the code into your laptop. Do we have all the uh, systemd parts fixed actually? Uh, we still have some open bugs in Blues upstream. So if you, if you know a Blues developer, <laughs> please come talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now I entered the uh, first factor and second factor and I logged in and looking at the uh, credentials, the Kerberos credentials, you can see that I actually have a fresh initial ticket, which means that this ticket actually has now authentication indicator saying that I, I did the two-factor step. We don't have on the client side and the Kerberos, actually in JSS API libraries, way to pick up this indicator and see and verify that it's actually valid and signed by all the parties. It's coming some point later, uh, but it's there. So the, the basics are there. <coughs> now what I can do with it, right, with this token. Okay, coming back. Here's a summary. Uh, we got the one-time password programmed to YubiKey. We handle login and SSSD notices that there is a pre-authentication request from the Kerberos server saying that I need more info and what info and it pushes the GDM to show that we log into the system verify it over a public network using a 
uh, Kerberos proxy forwards into the actual KDC. Then we got the ticket. First factor is provided to GDM to unlock the GNOME passwords and key storage. If we don't do this, uh, on the first logon ever in your system, uh, your GNOME key ring will be encrypted with a password that is for sure never will repeat again and you will, ne will not be able to encrypt, uh, 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 decrypt it. So wh <laughs> what we do is that we split these prompts. We provided infrastructure to actually handle prompts separately, exactly for this reason, for a small thing like a uh, reusable key store, <laughs> secret store. How does uh, this work when you're offline? If you are offline, SSSD has support for that. Uh, it knows that you are offline, you cannot reach the uh, uh, identity server and it only asks you for the uh, first factor. It asks for the first factor and then does the hash comparison with the uh, stored uh, hash of the uh, hash of hash basically of a local password uh, of the password that was used once. You cannot log in offline to the system that you never log on to. But if you log it once and you have this enabled, it's not enabled by default. And what happens, uh, you are offline, you log in, and then you connect to the net, what happens then? Um, at the first uh, attempt when the password will be needed, it will be uh, upgraded to the uh, online use, and you will get the request for the uh, password, uh, for the token. Again, credentials were entered only once. Now, um, if I have them, what I can do with them? Oh, almost everything. <laughs> so I can authenticate even against the wall, if the wall understands this protocol. I can obtain um, some assertion or any other equal thing that uh, basically reports back what, what this identity is. Um, I can access network file systems. That's the first thing that started like 15 or more, even more years ago. Uh, I can display properties of the tickets, I can renew tickets, I can choose what principle to use. And <coughs> to authenticate with JSS API, now uh, that's the interesting part. Uh, the uh, Epiphany the GNOME web browser does not support JSS API since 2009, when its support was removed uh, from Lipsoap. This is the famous bug that's still being fixed. It's almost fixed. Yeah. Like Do not spoil my presentation, <laughs> please. <laughs> so WebKit GTK is unusable for SAML or to interactions open ID, even if you want to um, involve in Kerberos. One cannot use, for example, Google Apps with GSS API and GNOME online accounts. No single sign-on as a result of it. Basically, that's it. <coughs> Can we do better than that? I would say yes. So let's look at the hacked version done by Tomasz Popola and David Woodhouse from Intel. Um, now, I'll be fast because I will be showing just demos, right? So I got login, I, I got the ticket, and now with that ticket I lo I'm logging into the uh, free IPA web UI uh, using the JSS API. The browser that I use is Epiphany. <coughs> it's a standard Fedora 23 with hacked uh, Lipsoap and WebKit GTK packages. Now, the next step, I go in GNOME Online accounts, and enter my email for this user, which as you can see in the background. Uh, and the Google then accepts it because I have paired my free API install with the identity provider called Epsilon, which supports pulling data from IPA, including email information, and pushing that data out to uh, to the service provider and Google Apps now a service provider to this. So I logged in into the docs and you can actually see that it, that's me once the cursor goes there. Yeah, that's the same email 
as the uh, as the one in the database. You have to pre-create users with uh, within the Google Apps, but at no point Google sees any uh, credentials you use. They get signed <coughs> assertion from your identity provider that is enough for them. <coughs> so what else? The Google Calendar bug is, uh, that's why you see this kind of, uh, uh, the screen is not really good there, right? Um, it's the bug with the browser for the user agent string, uh, which turns the Google Apps to, to serve you um, mobile. mobile version, yes. And you can see that I have all the, uh, in GNOME Online accounts, I have all this stuff basically enabled for uh, use of the, uh, well, session cookie that, that was obtained through the uh, Kerberos credentials. Okay. That's, that's the work uh, that we hope to get into GNOME 320. Can we do better than that? Yes. So that's exactly what happened here. The Google Apps accepted it. You can s uh, get more from Patrick's talk tomorrow about the same time, about Epsilon. And he will show some of these demos and his own demos as well. Um, this should work with any identity provider that knows how to use, how to utilize uh, SSSD features uh, that expand beyond POSIX attributes. Because email is not a POSIX attribute, and this is what um, Google cares about. Just a little implementation email. Does logging out work? Yes. Okay, good. I hate when you log out, it will immediately log yes. back in. Yes. <laughs> I think it had, it had created a lot of issues for Ypsilon guys when, when logout was implemented. Yes, so what we can do in the GNOME Online accounts a lot, we can visualize uh, and see the properties, but unfortunately those properties, they are not really well visible right now. I, I will skip parts of it. Um, we can have multiple um, credentials used and the one that, that you want to use can be selected uh, from the console using case switch uh, command but we would like to have something more uh, user friendly for your <laughs> definition of user and um, we can have ticket renewals and that's now a big problem that everybody complains who, whoever uses GNOME with Kerberos the ticket is expired, but nobody pops up a message for that or mm. does not initiate it. So I talk it with Debarshi on it, and hopefully we get we get this fixed at some point. Um, the browsers have their own problems. So Firefox, for example, needs manual configuration, but at least it's accessible for the uh, users. Chrome requires system-wide configuration or command line parameters that you have to specify all the time. We have the um, uh, Fixit Lipsoup, uh, WebKit GTK, Epiphany will just work against any uh, as, uh, HTTPS website as much as uh, Conqueror does already. But the Conqueror uh, HTML engine, for example, is not enough for Google Apps and for the uh, other applications. And there are some limits that you need to be aware of, like GSS API flow is uh, synchronous, so you have to do it outside of your UI thread, but that's not news for UI developers. But any, any kind of practical use of it, right? The Google Apps is one thing. You probably don't want to, to do Google Apps for your home if you want to stay under the budget, right? So let's do some practical thing. It's two minutes demo. I skip it one uh, demo in this one, and I'm showing uh, another one. So this is uh, actually I'm becoming an uh, administrator from Active Directory. This Active Directory it has established uh, cross forest trust relations with FreeIPA, and now I will use 
these credentials over Epiphany to log in into the own cloud instance that I have and that works with the Epsilon, with help of the Epsilon it accepts the uh, GSS API authentication. So now what will happen, it takes a bit of time, that this Windows administrator is actually part of my own <coughs> cloud environment. It does not exist in, in free IPA. It purely exists in the Active Directory that I have somewhere uh, under the table of my office. And you can actually see, I will get it a bit larger here and scroll it, that the cloud ID is a fully qualified username, including the uh, Realm or AD domain. So this is, this is something you can do, and practically, uh, yes, this is a setup uh, that I have hacked on clouds to basically accept uh, some of assertions coming from uh, Ypsilon and uh, auto-create users if they are uh, coming this way. Again, no need to enter passwords. From the first logon with the two-factor authentication, towards use of this application, I'm, I'm there, right? If I un unpause, we can see that we should be able to go into, we can see that tickets were obtained, a first <coughs> initial ticket for Active Directory Realm, then the Cross Forest ticket for accessing IPA resources, and then the ticket for Epsilon. So we got through the whole stages and, and finally got to the, uh, to the own cloud system. And credentials were entered only once. That's what I want to see in, let's say, Fedora 25. For majority of services that support GSS API uh, there. And I need your help. Actually, this is not existing in the standard own cloud community edition. Uh, own cloud company sells this as their uh, enterprise edition feature. So now I'm kind of commodizing that feature. And uh, even more, because they don't have support for Active Directory trusts and going through it, we do. Yes, and we want to have a GNOME Online accounts working well for all SAML enabled services, not just the way how, how it only works for Google uh, apps now, but doesn't work for uh, own cloud within the uh, <coughs> GNOME Online accounts. Free API also has support for user certificates, so you can actually plug the hole and have your own environment at home for or your small company, that way you trust your infrastructure. So you, I'm skipping this because that's what I showed. You can control your own infrastructure. That's the very important part of it. You can improve user experience. We become uh, older and older and we don't remember all these techy steps anymore. Well, 20, 40 years in future, is going to be an interesting challenge to every single one of us here. And finally, somebody can profit with it, not only Red Hat. Thank you. Um, I'm here, here and uh, today and tomorrow you can come and ask. Uh, I don't think we have any time left otherwise. Uh, I get kicked completely by the guys who do the call. Wait. Yes.